Welcome to Process Control Design and Practice. My name is Tom Meadowcroft. In this video, we will learn about degrees of freedom and multi-loop design. In the last lecture, we talked about states and objectives. In this lecture, we looked at how to translate objectives into automation designs for continuous systems. We will try to answer the questions, where do the sensors and valves need to go? Are there limits to what we can control? Continuous processes don't change in time. They maintain steady state, an unchanging mass balance. In practice, this means that the mass in vessels must be kept constant. How do we measure that mass? With level for a liquid and with pressure for a gas. Our control system will have to adjust stream flows to maintain liquid levels and gas pressures at their targets. That will leave one flow, the capacity flow, for the process manager to choose. The capacity flow determines the speed that mass is traveling through the whole process at steady state. Different flows will be the capacity flow for different processes. For most processes, we're not just moving mass around, we're trying to achieve some change, a reaction, a separation, or a series of both. That leads to quality objectives defined in compositions. For instance, 99% purity or a flow ratio, like stream B must be 10% of the feed stream. Often we use our ability to model thermodynamics to translate a composition objective into a temperature objective. For instance, maintain the column bottoms temperature at 135 degrees C to maintain the bottom product composition. Let's look at an example. T100 is the bottoms receiver of a distillation column. It is fed at a variable rate that we can't control, so this unit needs to react to that changing flow. The objectives for this unit are to maintain steady state by holding a 50% level in T100 and to cool the fluid so that the feed to T101 is at 50 degrees C. Pause the video here and try to write a design for this solution yourself. Note that the pump is single speed, so flow control should be accomplished with control valves. To design a solution for this problem, we should first decide how many degrees of freedom we have and then match those two objectives. There are two approaches we can take, a formal approach or a heuristic approach. The formal approach is to write a model, in particular a mass and a heat balance around T100. In the mass balance, M is the mass in T100, while F in and F out are the mass flows in and out. In the heat balance, C sub P is the heat capacity, T in and T out are uh, temperatures of the inlet and outlet flows, and delta H jacket is the heat removed by the cooling water in the T100 jacket. There are seven variables and two differential equations, but C sub P is a constant. So seven variables minus three equations gives four degrees of freedom. But hold on, the problem statement makes it clear that the inlet flow and its temperature can't be controlled. We have to react to changes in them. That leaves us with only two degrees of freedom and four variables that aren't spoken for. The outlet flow and temperature, the mass in T100, and the heat flow to the jacket. Our objectives were to maintain a 50% level and to control T out at 50 degrees C. Those are clearly represented by M and T out. We must use the outlet flow, F out, and delta H jacket as our only remaining variables to control M and T out. When we draw this in a piping and instrumentation diagram, or PNID, it appears like this. LT-T100 is a level transmitter for T100, from which we can infer M. TT-T100 is a temperature transmitter that measures the T100 temperature, which will be the T out temperature leaving T100. A control valve on the outlet flow manipulates our first degree of freedom, F out, the outlet flow. 
A second control valve manipulates the cooling water flow to T100's jacket, and thus the rate of heat transfer to the jacket. Two feedback controllers decide how to manipulate the valves to control and maintain the measured variables. See the description of how we draw PNIDs in the text. I mentioned that there is a second method called the heuristic method for satisfying objectives with degrees of freedom. First, we have to determine the capacity flow from the description, the flow that determines the throughput of the process. Clearly, the capacity flow here in this example is the uncontrolled inlet from the column to T100. Next, we determine what mass inventories, it was levels for liquids, pressures for gases, need to be maintained for steady state. In this example, we need to maintain the liquid level in T100. With the inlet flow uncontrolled, only the outlet flow is available to maintain steady state. That allows us to satisfy any quality objectives with the remaining available flows. The quality objective here is the outlet temperature, and the only remaining controllable flow is the cooling water flow to the jacket. The solution is the same as you would expect. The advantage of the formal method is that it relies on thermodynamic first principles of degrees of freedom. The disadvantage is that a full mass and heat balance for many standard unit operations like a reactor, an absorber, or a distillation column can be very complex, even though only a few degrees of freedom are present. The heuristic method guides you to a solution faster. You may note that we were fortunate enough to have exactly the right number of degrees of freedom to reach our steady state and quality objectives. What if instead there had been no temperature objective? What would we do with the cooling water flow? This would be an underspecified problem with more degrees of freedom available than are needed. To complete the problem, we would either decide to keep the cooling valve closed or add a second objective. What if instead we had a third objective to maintain the outlet flow at a constant 50 gallons per minute? With the inlet flow uncontrollable and the outlet flow fixed, there would be no way to maintain a steady state level in T100. The tank would drain or overflow. There is no solution to an overspecified problem. Let's look at a second, slightly more complicated example, namely a flash tank. Here heat is applied to a binary mixture of A and B from T1 using the steam heat exchanger E1. When the mixture of A and B reaches T2, some of it vaporizes, forming a mostly B vapor stream and a purified A liquid stream. B clearly has a higher vapor pressure than A. The objective for this flash tank unit is to deliver 3,000 kilograms per hour of 98% purified A to storage. The formal mass and heat balance for this system is presented in the text and consists of 18 variables and 9 initial equations despite some simplifying assumptions. So let's tackle it with the heuristic method. First, what is the capacity flow? The problem statement specifies a fixed flow of 3,000 kilograms per hour for the purified A liquid leaving the flash tank bottom. We'll need to measure and control that flow first. Next, what inventories must be maintained for steady state? Clearly, there's a liquid level in T2, so that must be controlled. We have a vapor stream in this problem, so we can't ignore the vapor inventory. The pressure in the vapor space of T2 must be controlled as well. With the outlet liquid flow fixed, we have the inlet flow and the outlet vapor flow as degrees of freedom to meet these two steady state objectives. With steady state achieved, we can address our quality objective, achieving 98% purity in the purified A product. Either a vapor liquid equilibrium model of A and B or experimental data from our flash tank will tell us what combination of pressure and temperature will be necessary to achieve that purity. We already have pressure controlled for our steady state, 
So to achieve our quality objective, what remains is to control the T2 temperature. The one remaining flow to achieve that is the steam flow to E1. Adding that feedback loop completes our control design. In the text, you will find further examples and exercises to practice both the formal method and the heuristic method for matching objectives to degrees of freedom for a continuous system. The formal method is rigorous, but increasingly impractical for more complex problems. But always remember that the thermodynamics rules of degrees of freedom are what is underlying the practical use of the heuristic method. Look for more videos at chemicalengineeringpractice.org. I'm Tom Meadowcroft. I hope to see you again soon.